do it. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen now. <laughs> but good morning. Good afternoon, should I say. It humbles me, and it is an honor and a privilege to have been appointed in this place, this hour. I want to thank Pastor Whitaker and the Lay Council for having confidence in me to speak on behalf of the Lay Council today. I also want to thank my spiritual advisor and my friend, one of my spiritual advisors, my friend John Walker, Reverend John Walker. And I also want to thank my brothers in the choir who gives me strength. <laughs> I could go down the line and name one by one and tell you a little bit about each one, but I think I better leave that to another time. <laughs> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to thine. Lord, I strength in my redeemer. You know, it warms my heart to see my family, Loretta, my friends, and I just want to introduce this one friend because he does something for the church you don't know. And that's Alan Thompson and his wife. He's the one that does the landscape around here, pro bono. I like him. I also would like to acknowledge Pastor Whitaker's family. Miss Whitaker and all the little Whitakers. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Reverend John Walker's wife, Marion. I want to take a little uh, sentence from Reverend Walker and to my wife, the love of my life. Now let me say that I do believe when Reverend Walker says that, he's talking about Mary, not about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that, John. <laughs> when I was asked to speak today by Pastor Whitaker, the first thing I did when I left his office was to approach God. I said, God, you gave me this assignment. Now you need to help me. For I want my message to glorify you. After a brief moment of thought entered my mind, it said, in your message, do you want to impress or make an impact? If I wanted to impress, I wouldn't be glorifying God. I thought about that for a while. And a word came to my mind to base my message on. However, a few days later, Sister Tolman, God bless her, handed me a theme <laughs> to lay counsel for this year. That sort of set me back a little. I go to God again, and I said, now, we're here, here is the result of my inquiry to God. I have entitled this message, Expansion in Our Circumstance. The theme for the late council, for the conference year 2012-2013, is expansion. Expanding the word to the ends of the earth. We accomplish this great commission by enlarging our perspective in kingdom building, expansion in service, stewardship, faith witnessing, by the way we live, our speech, and our actions, according to the scripture. We should be 
expanding our denomination through education of ourselves and others by evangelizing to the unsaved and promoting any other interests of God's kingdom. This task is a task for all Christians, not just for the clergy or evangelists or missionaries. The Great Commission commissions all Christians to take the gospel to the end of the earth. At a conference of ministers, pastors in Russia, the moderator asked each pastor to stand and give his name and the church he pastored. This one pastor stood, and to the amazement of everyone present, said, of all the pastors, I am the most faithful to the Great Commission. Everyone was speechless about this remark until he explained. He passed a church at the Arctic Circle, and the name of the town was the end of the earth. In some respects, the gospel did reach the end of the earth, <laughs> but has it really? I've spoken to people who feel that unless they bring a mass of people to Christ, as Peter did in Acts, they are not carrying out the Great Commission. The word of God spreads like ripples on a pond, where from a single center each way goes out furthering God's news. We don't have to change the world single-handedly. And the scripture that I quote is coming from the Life Application Study Bible, so it might not be exactly the words that might be in your in the Bible uh, in your pews. But in Luke 15, 7, this is Jesus speaking. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who represents, who repents, than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So why fret? Because you only bring forth one person at a time. In John 1, Andrew was known for bringing people to Jesus. Immediately after meeting the Lord, he introduced his brother Simon Peter to Jesus. Later he found a boy with five loaves and two fish and brought him to Jesus. When some Greeks wanted to meet Christ, Andrew and Philip introduced them to Jesus. Expansion of the word of Christ goes on today. Also in Matthew, Jesus left the disciples with these last words of instruction. They were under his authority. They were to make more disciples. In previous missions, Jesus had sent his disciples only to the Jews. Their mission from now on will be worldwide. Jesus is the Lord of earth, and died for the sins of the people from all nations. So why are we so laid back? God said it, and that's so. In every walk through this life, we can expand the gospel, beginning in our homes, in the schools, at work, at social gatherings, and even in church. When Philip was directed by an angel in Acts 8 to intercept the Ethiopian official on the desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza and explain to him the good news, the official's conversion <coughs> brought Christianity into the power structure of another government. That was the beginning of the witness to the ends of the earth. You build a group, one person at a time. It is the endurance of one believer that produces a multitude. What makes Christianity attractive? It is easy to be drawn to churches because of programs, good speakers, its size, 
beautiful structures or fellowship. People in the early church brought the gospel to people by expressing of God's power at work, to generosity, the sincerity, honesty, and unity of its members, and the character of its leaders. Have our standards dropped? God wants us to, wants to add believers to his church, not just newer or better programs, larger or fancy facilities. When Andrew answered the call to discipleship, <coughs> Jesus told him he'd be a catcher of men instead of fish. Since we too are followers of Christ, we have the same assignment. Our styles and our, opportun and our opportunities vary, but we're each responsible <coughs> to, develop, to develop a lifelong habit of bringing others to Jesus. When you talk with people about God, be aware they will not understand if they are not ready. Yet be patient, taking every chance to tell them more about God. Not often where sharing the good news will send us to jail as it did Peter and John. Still, we run the risk in trying to win others to Christ. We might be willing to face a night in jail if it would bring 5,000 people to Christ. But shouldn't we also be willing to suffer rejection and persecution, even for one? What do you risk in witnessing? Whatever the risk, realize that nothing done for God is wasted. We should be committed to the Great Commission. One thing we shouldn't do, waiting for Christ's return, is to stand around, staring at the sky, but working hard to share the good news so that others will be able to share in God's great blessings. Now let's unite expanding the gospel in circumstances. Circumstances play a role in how we go about expanding the gospel. A look at circumstance. Circumstance in the Bible, in the Webster Dictionary, is defined as happening, a fact, a fact or event accompanying another. Now, if you understand that, tell me about it. <laughs> For me, that's a little hard to understand. You go to one dictionary, find the definition of a word. Then you have to go to a few more to find the definition of the word that the first you gave. <laughs> so let me attempt to explain. People often predict future, the future based on current circumstances. In other words, cir circumstances is usually the criteria for gauging chances for success. Sometimes these automatic excuses are, are used for failure. Circumstances beyond our control. If only circumstances were different. Many are more interested in changing their circumstances than on changing themselves. For them, circumstances are primary. I did not know that there is a science that dates back to the 18th century. It studies the outcome of circumstances, the right or wrong of one's conduct and its outcome. It is called consequential circumstances. How we react to circumstances are reflected in our attitude and conduct. How we react circumstances can hinder us from expanding the gospel. God controls all circumstances. We make a choice either to rely on our own understanding or acknowledge the Lord has the wisdom, the 
power and right to direct our lives. We can't blame God for an environment we created. Are you able to get along happily, be content in any circumstances you face? Paul knew how to be content whether he had plenty or when he was in need. The secret was believing on Christ's power for strength. Do you have great needs? Are you discontented because you don't have what you want? If you always want more, ask God to remove that desire and teach you contentment in every circumstance. He will supply all your needs in a way that he knows is best for you. Is God giving you an assignment to expand the gospel? There is a high cost for resisting God. Jonah found himself in a circumstance and decided to run from God when he spent three days in a great fish. Who's to blame? God. Of course not. He ran from an assignment from God. Perhaps you had the same problem he had. God plans, the circumstances he places you in, and it didn't match your plans. We just coast along, enjoying fellowship with the Lord, until that day he asks us to do something we don't like. That is when our de devotion is tested. If you resist, he will allow a storm to rage in your soul until you submit to his authority. And then he will change your circumstances. Rebellion carries a high price. We lose not only peace and joy, but also future opportunities. Our choice will determine a positive or negative outcome of circumstances. The Lord sometimes provides providential intervention. Let's take the story of Bartimaeus in John 9 and Matthew 10. I'm sure we agree that his circumstance of being blind was not good. However, he did not waddle in his circumstances. He seen the providential intervention in his life when he was told Jesus was passing by. He didn't waddle. He could have continued in the circumstances surrounding him, being blind, but he rose to the occasion and recognized his providential intervention in his life. He was persistent and did not allow others who told him to be quiet to deter him from approaching Jesus. This happened to glorify God. There are others in the Bible that recognize providential intervention. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Jehoshaphat, Daniel, Joseph, the list goes on of those that recognize their providential intervention. Whose circumstances would have been negative if they choose to disobey God? Let's not forget about expanding the gospel and circumstances go hand in hand. Today's culture bombards us with all sorts of information, but not necessarily the truth. How we view and accept or denounce this information dictates the circumstances we find ourselves in. We live in a world that mixes truth with error and attempts to blur the line between good and evil. We can be protected from negative circumstances by walking in the center of God's will. At times we make mistakes, confusing God's voice with our own thoughts, marching out on our own, 
We can respond to our circumstances by possessing self-discipline. You have to rise above your circumstances. Those who do have a great chance for success and those who cannot are doomed to failure and sorrow. Let me address one thing of a member of our church that I want to tell you about his circumstances. And believe me, I asked him before I said this because I was personally involved in this. Some time ago, and I'm sure there's many others in here that they can relate a story like this. Brother Brown and I were out in the entrance of the church, and we were discussing hiring a sexton, because the one we had, he was up to left. So if you talk about a providential intervention, over in the corner, God placed John Jones, who overheard our conversation. And he said, what about me? Uh -huh. So you know the rest of the story. However, that only two years later, we were talking about something. And God told me how grateful he was for God to put him in a place, the job he has now. Amen. <laughs> Prior to receiving that job, John was about to lose his car. He was about to get put out had nothing to rely on. But he tells me now he owns his car. <laughs> All his, his, his living accommodations are taken care of. But during that very time that he was struggling, and you can be witnesses, he brought people to the altar. He never forgot. He never worried about his circumstances. He worried about saving a soul. God bless you, John. In Philippians, it reads, I focus on one thing Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. The saying, let your conscience be your guide, to me is not wise. If your conscience is not focused on heavenly things, your conscience will be your downfall. Yes. When we kneel before the Lord in prayer and truly ask him to take care of the negative circumstances in our lives, we can be relieved of its weight. Some dark, sometime, God may choose to miraculously change the circumstance. Then often, he allows them to remain, at least for a little while, till he gets your attention. Although you must make quick decisions, it's wise to step back and consider your full range of options, asking God what is best. I don't know how much you pay attention to the past. But when you approach him in my experience, you approach him with a question or with a statement of any kind. You don't answer you right away. Amen. He'll stop, and look at you, and look down, and look up, and then he'll come back. Okay? I don't know what's going on in his mind, but when I wrote this, he came to my mind. He searched for the options, and then he asked God what is best. There's another example of asking God what is best. This is true while shopping. I can look over there. Wait. <laughs> while some may agree, argue, 
that God doesn't need to be consulted on every purchase. But they wish they had when that bill comes. <laughs> There is a list called the least powerful people in the world. Least powerful people. They were corporate executives, sports figures, politicians, and celeb celebrities who shared one common characteristic. They used to be powerful. They were victims of circumstances that were brought upon by bad business decisions, other lost their influence because of more failure, not making the right choices. Where the Lord places us is up to Him, but what we do where He puts us is up to us. Amen. <laughs> Moses led the people out of Egypt, but they kept turning their backs on God. Idol worshiping, immorality, grumbling were among the things that brought them down. Jesus never let circumstances control his emotions or dictate his actions. We say we want to be like Jesus, but we need to rise above our circumstances. And we don't consider the consequences of our actions. Our actions can, can even reach into eternity. What I try to do here is to get us to answer the question, are we expanding the gospel? If not, why not? Since we too are followers of Christ, we all have the same assignment. Carry the gospel to the end of the earth. And in our witnessing, we should pray that the Lord of the harvest will cause the word to take root in receptive heart. I have read commentary pertaining to Jeremiah 8.20, and I found one that coincides with this message. In Jeremiah, the people had refused to believe Jeremiah's message. From God. So God had to send a foe from the north to judge them, as they were surrounded by troops. The crops on the outside were ready to be harvested, but they were unable to harvest them. And as they were sure starving on the inside, the crops were rotting in the fields. The summer had passed, and the harvest not be harvested. Time had run out on them where they had crossed God's deadline. I want to share some harvesting times that are passing away that you and I should be concerned about. The harvest is passing away from our country. Our country is us. Psalms 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Amen. I believe if God has a word for America today, us, to wake up. Harvest time is passing away. Repent or else you will face my judgment. God always sends warning mercy, and then his judgment. He did it in old day, and he will do it in our day. America is like a runaway train. She is living on one big high of excitement. Us. But she had better be aware of the wreck ahead unless we the harvest is passing away for our church. John 4, 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest.